Welcome everybody to our developer mentorship. This is our first month um, and our topic today is when to use what, determining the appropriate use case for each script type. Um, this will be a series of ongoing um, developer mentorships. We're gonna have monthly topics and we'll go over that at the end, what to expect in the coming months and the associated sessions that will follow after each topic. Before we get started today, just wanna go through our safe pasture statement. Um, go Virtual Office recommends, um, based on our general best practices, um, NetSuite functionality is, um, that's common to each account. Each functionality is different. Um, and they vary depending on which edition and modules you have purchased. And we highly recommend that you validate anything that you plan to move forward with in production in your Sandbox account before you make any changes. All right, we are gonna get into our, um, our presenters today um, and learn a little bit more about our developers on the call. Um, introducing Greg, um, go ahead, Greg. Hi, I'm Greg Lindner, and I've been with Go Virtual Office since 2013. I've been doing uh, software development for about 30 years, and uh, for the last uh, roughly 11 years of that, I've been at Go Virtual Office working in the NetSuite space. Um, and uh, it says here my passions are uh, traveling and uh, I'm spending time with my kids and playing guitar. Thanks so much, Greg. Corey? Uh, hello, I'm Corey Mant. Uh, I started at Go Virtual Office in 2017. Um, I have experience in Sweet Commerce, Sweet Script, integration development. Um, so yeah, and also I have my, my passions as well. I play music, uh, fishing, and spending time with my wife and two dogs. All right, thanks so much. And my name is Matt Connery. I'll be your host and moderator for this series. I started with Go Virtual Office back in uh, early 2022. Um, my background includes web administration, e-commerce, and content management. Um, I am a functional consultant on the Boost team, and some of my passion, some of my passions include um, running around with my daughter and two dogs, and uh, being a big fan of the Green Bay Packers. Sorry to any Vikings fans on the call. All right. So now we're gonna get into our topics for today. I'm gonna to hand it over to Corey and Greg who are gonna go into each script type and when to use them and why to use them and give a bit of a background, um, show some of our repository and um, some of our best practices associated with each script. Yeah, so the first one here, we're just, so the purpose of this is to kind of give a high level you know, overview of the different script types, when to use them, when to apply them, certain situations. Uh, the first one we're gonna start with is user event scripts. It's a pretty common one. Um, and then we'll kind of transition to, there's gonna be five of them. So this will be our first. I'm going to actually share my screen and we're gonna jump right into one of our repositories where I can show an example of a sales where I think it's easier to just uh, step through it. So let me share it here. Okay, so this is a, an example of a pretty basic sales order user event script. So um, it is running, like I said, on the sales order, and we have three we have three entry points. Right, we have the before load, and at the bottom here we can see these before load, before submit, and after submit. So we'll start with the before load. This is going to be this is going to be your opportunity to essentially affect the UI of the record so you can add buttons um, prior to the record loading so before it actually before it's loaded you can make modifications we use this a lot for adding buttons um, or other type of field modifications um, Greg you had a few examples too right that you've that you've experienced with yeah um, a lot of times we'll use uh, before load to redirect a user back to view mode uh, for instance if uh, there are specific conditions that you can't control through user permissions or through roles uh, you may need to you know, do something more complicated and you can control that in a before load submit where you evaluate the record and the conditions and can redirect the user back to view mode uh, 
And the, in the same way, you could also maybe lock down some fields that you didn't want them to touch or expose some fields that uh, should be exposed in some cases. Yeah, and, and the the view mode is a, it's a good call out too, because you can see in this in this example, our part of our conditional here is that we're making sure that this button only shows in view mode. Um, that can that helps, you know, because we're we're if, especially if you're not trying to affect the record. Like in this instance here, where we have a simple just it's an email type of script that we're going to be using. We'll leverage a client script and a suite script. But what this does is this adds the button to the UI only in view mode. So when you get to the record, generally that's how people first come to the record in view mode. Then you can. Um, launch this suite lit and send an email. So uh, edit, you know, doing anything like placing buttons in edit mode, you have to kind of be careful, especially if you're going to be affecting the record because it's already loaded in that case. So um, anything else to note on that, Greg? No, I think that pretty well covers it. Yeah. So the second state, our second entry point is the before submit. So this is an opportunity to modify or essentially stop the record from saving whatever you need so validation purposes um, data modification you can do that before the record persists to the database so before it, you essentially get in front of this record before it's going to make its way to the database you can uh, add data points so for an example this is this is the same um, type of email what we're doing is we're looking specifically for uh, a sales order coming in from a web, uh, web, a REST web service, so an integration, and we're looking to see if it's a create. If it meets that criteria, we're looping through the lines and we're doing this to find a few specific items. If we find these items on the line, we want to add a message to a custom field that we've created. It's basically a, pr a promotional message. So um, if they if they purchase those items, we say you know use a promo code test promo with your next purchase to receive 10% off. That's going to be stamped on the sales order. And it will be there on the next time it's loaded. So this, you know, typically you would try to do these kind of things through the integration, right? You want the integration to bring over certain data points, but this is something that we're just kind of getting in front of. We're 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 just making a slight modification to add this message. So um, other use cases, Greg, for for submit. Uh, I mean, before submit is really all about uh, doing pre-commit. Uh, whatever actions that you need to do to a record pre-committed to the database. So anything that you can think of that you would need to do to a record before it's uh, committed to the database, thinking about a table that as soon as you click submit, um, all this stuff is going to happen and it's going to be written to a table. And so if you need to update that record, this is the place to do it for the most part. Uh, and we did have a question come up once, uh, whether somebody should do uh, like validation that prevents say in a before submit. And that's something that I think we have to be really cautious with because it's not a very pleasant user experience to throw an error and the user gets directed to uh, an error message uh, that's not really friendly. It's usually a NetSuite error. And uh, um, I think that this is probably, you know, doing validation to some extent, uh, doing validation in what we call X-Edit or inline editing where a system has made the change versus a user in the UI making a change. Uh, those are appropriate places where you can throw an error or prevent save and before submit, but uh, I would just say use caution. Right. And even in like the case of a, or of an integration, nine times out of 10, somebody's going to want that record to make its way into NetSuite, right? If there's something wrong with it, they're still going to want that record to be there and there'll be some way of catching whatever issue there may have been. Because if you throw an error back to to the request, um, then the, the, the third party system's gonna know about it, but NetSuite's not going to. I mean, you can, it'll log an error, but usually people want, especially when it comes to sales orders, people want orders coming into their system like nine times out of 10, so. Mm -hmm. All right, and then the, the third stage, final stage of a uh, user event is after submit. So just like the title, it's basically after after that record's been submitted, this is the chance to do anything else that you need to do. Um, certain use cases would be for, like this one, 
emailing. So we know if it's a create, we want to load the record. And actually what we're doing, we're using the, the record that comes in through the context. So we're not really loading the record, but we're, we're um, rendering a PDF using that record. And then we're gonna send an email off to the context that for the customer that purchased it. This is this is just a use case that we came up with, but essentially it goes back to that needing to set that field in a before submit for the message. Now that message is there on the sales order. So when it's sent through an email, you're sending a copy of that sales order, that message is gonna be there for them to see. So um, other cases of after submit, um, I mean, we have, let's see. So if you have any other records that need to be affected, this is a good place to do it. So there's there's times where, I mean, I just ran into a situation where um, it was an estimate. After an estimate is created and the after submit, we have to go and update a data point on the customer record. So it's always important to make sure like th those are dependencies. The dependency there is that this record saves. So once that record saves, we're clear to do whatever we need to do. Um, and then have, let's see, what else can we think of for an after submit? I feel like, I feel like the, the most, the most times it's going to be something that you need to do after the record is saved. And, you know, you don't want to do these things in a, in a before submit because there's a chance that that record could, could air out. And then, you know, you're missing a step in what it needs. Like if that record is dependency for the next step, it's not going to be there. So, um, yeah, so that, that is after submit. Those are all three of our stages here for a user event. Great. Thanks, Corey. Um, <clears throat> before we move on to the next topic, we did receive a question from one of our guests. Um, we wanted to run by you. Um, the question is, if the user wanted to create a button with a before load, but only for certain users, how would he then filter by current user in the script? And is this found in the context variable? So you wouldn't, this would be if you're trying to limit the button to be displayed in view mode based on a certain user, it would be, I mean, typically we would do it by role, right? So a certain role can only see it. And that kind of goes back to what Greg was alluding to with fields, like being able to set permissions. So you can use the the runtime module which will give you access to you know the the user you can get access to the role so then you can look to see you know if this if this user whoever is accessing this record has a certain role i mean technically you could do it by id right so like you would have to, if you're looking for a certain employee you could narrow it down by id so you could say if this employee uh has an id or if the the user who is interacting with this record has an employee ID of this, then don't show the button or show the button, right? So you just use a conditional in, in that sense. Um, additionally, besides controlling it through uh, checking within the, the contents of the script, if your script is only displaying the button, doesn't need to run for any other user, you also have the ability to control who that script runs for. So uh, you could specify either by employee or by role at the script deployment level, uh, who would see the button? Yep, that's a good call too. It's probably better to even leverage the deployment record in that sense because, you know, it's that's what it's there for. So, well, right, and again, it depends on what all the user event script is doing. If it's only displaying the button, and the goal is to hide the button from specific users, only make it available to specific users. In that case, for sure, it makes sense just use the deployment permissions, uh, but if you've got like six different functionality, you know, six, six different functions in that script, maybe you need some of them to work, right. but some of them not. Great. Our next topic is going to be client-side scripts. Why don't I just jump right to a client-side script here, Greg? Yeah, are you still sharing your screen? Here, here we go. Yeah, so client side scripts, uh, you have to think of these are um, script that runs in the browser. So uh, 
when we say client side, what we really mean is running in the browser. And uh, these are really all kind of, uh, if you think about what's happening with HTML behind the scenes, these are like event triggers. Something's happening on the record and there's a response uh, through the UI. So we just start going down the list here. There's uh, field changed. And uh, that one seems pretty obvious what it would be for. You change a field, this is going to get triggered. And uh, you can specify within this uh, function which fields you want to monitor. And then uh, what are you going to do as you're monitoring that field? Uh, a lot of times you're going to use uh, a field changed event for um, uh, maybe doing validations, uh, saying that to, you know maybe they shouldn't pick something if uh, another field value doesn't have a specific value. Uh, there are a number of reasons why you might want to um, uh, do, you, you know use validation on field change. Uh, and then uh, what's our next one here? Uh, line init. These are kind of not in the order that I would probably, this may not make sense to go through them in, in this specific order, but I think we're just going to do it this way because it's easier. Uh, but line in it is, uh, is a line level function. And uh, as you create a new line or uh, enter into a new line in a uh, record that has a sublist, uh, this will get triggered. And uh, uh, a use case for this might be, um, so you, you enter into a line and uh, uh, you want to enable a specific field. So you can uh, enable a field, allow them to key something in uh, when they're basically entering in a line. Um, Corey, there's got to be a better reason, another reason to uh, use a line in. I don't typically use line it in it. Uh, not very often yeah, so i'm having a hard time coming up with a great use case for it it's pretty rare because even like sourcing fields and on the line after selection is made you're not really using this you're using a post sourcing or a field changed so yeah so um, it's probably just a rare function it's available if you can come up with a use case for it i guess that's great but um we, we just don't typically use it often um page in it on the other hand that's a little more common um and uh, the page init function is uh, about uh, as the page is loading, uh, basically before it's loading, before the user can access anything on the page, this is running. And uh, maybe you want to collect some information on the page to be used later. That's a common use case where we'll assign some variables that maybe we need down the road. Uh, like maybe on a field changed event, you want to see what uh, uh, the values were before anything was changed. Um, uh, maybe you want to uh, change some, uh, like disable some fields, uh, and I'm going to backtrack a little bit and say that uh, uh, we tend to stray away from client scripts for things like that. Uh, we would prefer to do that kind of activity in a user event script, but there are cases where it becomes necessary uh, to use a client script. Um, a lot of times our rule is uh, if the client has to see it happen, we have to do it in a, in a client script. So, um, but typically the things that I'm talking about, we're, we're usually doing these kind of things in a user event script, not in a client script. Um, yeah, I'd say I, I had a situation like that come up where Essentially, you know, it, it all came down to the fact that a field had to be selected prior to me being able to set a field value in them. So like, ideally we would love to do that before load, right? Just load the record and set that field, but there's a dependency and it's that field. So yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a perfect use case for something that you would want to do in a page in it because you can't get to it in the before load. Um, and that's actually kind of a good segue into the post sourcing because uh, post sourcing is uh, all about uh, when you set a value in field A, field B that has a dependency on field A may have changed. And so you want to be able to do um, evaluation after field B has changed, uh, then you need to use post sourcing. So. Um, 
save record uh, that is prior to commit. This is where uh, I would say our prob probably our most common use case for a client scripts is with save record and doing validation where you want to make sure that the user uh, receives a, a fair warning or the right kind of prompting and you can prevent record save here in a very friendly way to the user, explain exactly what's wrong before they commit the data and uh, be able to guide them uh, in a way that allows them to easier or fix it more easily. Do you have anything else to add to that, Corey? Yeah, I guess like with these validation functions, you see like we're returning true here, but typically I would do create a variable like do save and then your logic will determine whether or not that should be set to true or false. Because when if you return if you return false, it's going to prevent that record from saving. Um, so anything with any of these validation scripts that's returning the true or false to to prevent it or to allow it to save. Which if you don't have that returned, it can get frustrating because you forget. Oh yeah, I need to return something here, or else it just won't save. So that's also happened. Yeah. Uh, the subtle has changed functionality. Uh, it's another one that I don't find myself using very often, but uh, I know that we can use this to do things like triggering, um, uh, like uh, more validation, I guess. Like uh, somebody changes the sub list, maybe you need to reevaluate the total and make sure everything aligns. Uh, maybe you're trying to limit the number of rows that can be added to a sublist. Uh, and it's not it's not one that I find myself commonly using, but uh, that's the kind of the gist of it is that uh, if the sublist has changes to it, this is going to trigger and you can take the appropriate actions at that point. And it does provide you the operation that happened as well. So if you need to look for a specific sublist operation, you can find that in the context. And then, uh, does, this, does this say validate? Line? This is validate, delete. Validate, delete, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> right, if somebody is... Uh, actually, I'm not sure if I've even ever used this one, but I believe this is going to uh, validate on delete of the record itself. So if you're clicking the delete button, and you need somebody to, to double check something or you maybe want to prevent delete, I think this is going to be the same kind of thing as the save record. But instead of save, it's validating whether you're deleting the record and you could return false here and prevent them from deleting it. Uh, validate field. Um, that uh, is triggered after a field has been set. So uh, the field is being set to some value, it, you validate it. It's already, it already contains that value, so it's a little different than field changed, I believe. Um, actually, I think I've got that backwards. It's this, this is the one that does, uh, if you validate field, it will prevent you from, or you can prevent the user from actually committing the data uh, by returning false, same as you could with a save record. And it's right. field change is the one that actually does change the, the value. And um, uh, you can check the value after it's been set and you could revert it back. But this is probably a better place to do it. Validate field would allow you to prevent them from setting the value basically from the get go. Just return false here and and uh, probably give them a message saying why they can't set that field right. value. But, uh, I could see like a case of that, right? It's like if it's an email field, it needs to contain an at sign so it can right. throw that message or something. And uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, validate, validate insert. insert. Okay, yeah, validate insert. It's another one that I, I can't think of a time I've ever even used that, but uh, maybe you would want to use that if. Uh, uh, you're trying to prevent somebody from inserting rows into a record. Maybe um, when they insert something, you need to do uh, new math or something at the line level. Uh, can't think of a great use case for it right now, but uh, I, that is what what happens. Go ahead, Corey. There's there's one 
case that I came across recently, and it was it was basically a field that needed to have a value in a certain situation. So it couldn't be strictly mandatory because it it's not true that it could always that it always needs it. So like I had to before inserting the line, I had to check to make sure a certain division was there, and if that division's there, then this field's mandatory. If that division's not there, then it's not mandatory. So that was the the, the most recent use case I've had for that. Nice. So that's the first yeah. time that I've probably ever seen that in action. Well, I haven't seen it, but heard about it in action. And uh, then of course the uh, validate line, which is going to operate the same way as like a, a save record or the delete record or uh, where you, you just prevent the user from being able to commit that line. Uh, it doesn't remove the line, but it prevents them from saving that line. It's not going to be committed. You're not going to be able to save the record as long as that's returning false. So if you're okay with whatever they're doing, you return true. Uh, but if you need to do some kind of validation that prevents them from committing that line, then this is where you do that. Yeah, so that's, that is the list of our entry points here with uh, client site scripts. But like Greg mentioned, you know, we try to be really careful because we have to keep in mind that this takes a performance hit on the, on the front end because this is client side. So, if you've got a bunch of these running and they're all trying to do something, they all have to wait their turn because it's synchronous, right? So it's going to be all running in order. So, All right, so that's right. client side scripts. Thanks, guys. We are going to move right along to our next topic, which are MapReduce scripts. All right, MapReduce scripts. So we have an example here, but I guess before I start, this is this is the type of script that you would use for pr bulk processing, right? So you have multiple records that you want to process, you need to make changes to. Um, historically, we've used scheduled scripts prior to the existence of MapReduce scripts. Um, so that's why we haven't, we're not really touching on scheduled scripts here is because we feel that MapReduce scripts essentially replace the need for them. Right, so, um, and it really comes down to, I think, the record, the amount of records they need to process, right? Like, I know with like schedule scripts, we'd always have to check to see where we're, we're at for our, um, oh, why is it slipping my mind, Greg? Uh, are you talking about governance? Governance, our governance, there it is. Right, because each each stage is going to have its own set of governance in the MapReduce, but like schedule script, you have to check where you're at and have to restart. So let me switch over to code. So we have MapReduce. This is, you know, there are there are cases where we don't even really we'll use either the map or the reduce, but I came up with a situation here that uses both because I think it's important to. To really show, like Greg and I have talked about in the past, like if you're not using all of them, you're not really using MapReduce to its full capability. And I feel like the 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 magic in this comes down to being able to to map and then reduce. So, for instance, we have our Git input. So we have we have a simple query here that we're just looking for transactions that were created within the last 30 days, and they're actually sales orders. So, looking for sales orders within the last 30 days, we're doing an inner join to the customer because we want to get the email address because like the previous previous scripts, we enjoy sending emails. So this is going to also be sending an email. Um, so down, so here we, we basically return the, um, the query in our input stage. That's going to send us, that's going to give us our results in our map. Now, Greg, you want to talk about like, there are different ways that you can do this, right? And we've, we see many different ways that you can return your input um, the reason you do it this way, do you want to explain that? I think it's a good thing to point sure. out. <laughs> so we're talking about how you've created on line 41, the results, uh, variable rate right, of constant. Well, and also and... how we've, why we're returning okay. this query, so sending it through. Yeah. Starting from the, from the get input data stage and, uh, like the different methods that you can use to submit data to the map or the reduce stage. Is that what you're yeah. getting at? Yeah, because yeah, so, I know, yeah, the limits so, around. 
I, um, you can use a safe search. You can use a, a JSON object. You could use a CSV. You could use a CSV or CSV content. You could use a CSV file. Um, there are many different ways of passing data through. I, I prefer using SQL. And that's probably because I came from a SQL background, but uh, comfortable with SQL. It also, I feel like gives me uh, the most freedom uh, to be able to collect the data in the way that I want to collect it and uh, pass it through to the next stage. And uh, one of the problems that SQL presents though uh, is that when it comes through to the next stage, it drops all of your SQL aliases off. So uh, this first section of the, the map stage is actually about rebuilding the aliases that you assigned in your in your SQL statement. Right. And, you know, you in the input stage, like you said, you can pass an object. So like you could just run your query, right, to run your SQL query in the input stage and then return those mapped results. But there's a limit then to the results you can process. Isn't that correct? Right. It's 5,000 records if you are, or 5,000 rows of data. Uh, if you're collecting data from a query, and uh, you wouldn't necessarily be limited to running a single query. You could do something where you're iterating over some kind of loop that queries and requeries, and you could build out data that way. But it, I think it's much more efficient to let NetSuite run the query and return the full result set. Is there a limit in this situation when we're doing it this way? Um, I I have this feeling that it's a million rows. Um, okay, but, then, okay. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, and I believe that limitation is 100,000 records if you don't have Sweet Analytics Connect. So right. there's, there is a limitation. Yeah. It's, it's there... big. Yeah, and that's and that's the reason why I bring that up because, you know, there's, I feel like you you, you can miss out on a lot of data to process if you try to run your your um, query in the input stage and return the map results to the map stage, rather than just letting giving the actual whole query itself to return in the input stage. Then your results differ quite. Much. I mean, five thousand to a hundred thousand. That's a big. A big adjust or a big difference so that's why i want to pick, point that out and that's why we need this here though when we do it this way because like you said greg we dropped the alias we need to reformat our our data so that's what this does here um so in the map stage this is a really good opportunity so for for what we're doing here um we're going to use our key which is how we're going to group now our sales orders we're going to group these transactions by customer so we're going to say each each transit so right because a customer could have multiple transactions that month we want to make sure that when it gets passed to reduce that the, all those customers transactions are contained together so then we can process them all together so this is where this map comes in play so we we write the customer um, we send over the, the email and the, the sales order id then in our reduce we're going to see this is where we're going to hit our um our groups, right? So our, our context.key is going to be the customer ID in this situation because that's what we were um, setting it in a map. And then here's where, you know, we haven't done this yet. All right, we're not sending an email yet, but this is where our logic would be to actually send the email. So now they're going to get an email with multiple transactions rather than if we skip the reduce stage, a customer has five transactions, they're gonna get five emails, which could almost be like spamming. So we're gonna make sure we group it and do it the right way. So that's the advantage of, of using a map reduce in general is that you can really start to group your your data to perform it in a way like this with, for instance, customer data. Um, anything else you wanna add there, Greg? No, um, but maybe just a little bit. Um, so pre Sweet Script 2.0, uh, having to do all this in a scheduled script, I can say it was a real challenge. Uh, required a lot of um, uh, like looping 
rescheduling itself to get through the amount of data that you'd have to get to because of the 10,000 unit governance limit. And uh, when they released this uh, map reduce script, uh, we basically gained a ton of um, processing power because uh, being able to use multi-processing. So if an account has, um, say, five processors in it, you can let this run on all five processors and it's going to get through the data five times as fast. And it also is self-managing governance. So when, uh, when you have limitations of 5,000 units in the reduce stage, 1,000 units in the map stage, and I believe 10,000 units in both the summarize and the kind of the data stage. So you have to be careful about what you're doing in each of those in each of those uh, sections. But um, for the most part, you're not doing something. You're not going to be running something that's going to use 5,000 units of governance in the reduce stage. You're doing something like sending an email. You just, you know, you're using 10 units of governance or some small amount like that. But if you can imagine doing this in a uh, single stage script and you had to send out 10,000 emails, well, now you have to do something like rescheduling your script 10 times because you're going to run out of governance. Yep, that is, I think that's the most powerful thing about the MapReduce too. And there's, you know, we're going to talk about MapReduce and all these scripts in further detail later on, you know, in other um, topics, but there's, there's just so much that you can do about how you, I mean, like, even like, um, you can stop your script after a certain amount of time, you can prioritize, right, MapReduce scripts. So you don't bog down your system with one process for a good, you know, six hours. So um, there's a lot there, but that it's it's a very powerful script um and then this last stage is just a nice it's just an extra stage that really just kind of helps you monitor what's going on you know you can you can show errors that occurred in the in the reduce or i mean in the map and then also in the reduce there's also the input summary you can do that for the input summary as well um there's there's a lot you can do in summaries actually i've I've even had a case where we've had bulk processes running um, and had like a parent bulk pro parent bulk process that has children for each little process it does in there. And in the summarize, when I know the whole thing is done, I can go back and mark that parent as showing that it's done. All right. So like there are there are other things you can do within the summarize that but it's basically when you when it's all done running, now what would you like to do? So Anything else, Craig, on that? No, except it's my favorite script type. Yeah, we could, I mean, it's a good thing we'll talk about more depth later because there's a lot, I think, a lot to use. Yeah, a lot of advantages we've taken. Great. Well, before we move on to the next topic, we did get an incoming question for you both. Um, could you both briefly touch on script parameters and why you may use them over regular variables? Now that is a great question. Greg, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, so anytime you use, and I, I'm gonna assume that we're talking about constants here, the values that you want to inject into a script that uh, are one time, set, you know, set one time and not again. So uh, I'm gonna call it constant from here, but uh, let's say that uh, you have, um, a, maybe you're trying to build a PDF and you have a PDF template and uh, let's say you have multiple accounts, uh, sandbox accounts, and somebody creates that template uh, independently in each of your three accounts. So not like a copy to account, but uh, actually creates a template in, in each account separately. Um, and so they each have a different ID and you want to be able to reference that template uh, within your script. So you can hard code the ID and you can hard code the ID again in your version and uh, uh, your sandbox accounts and your, your production account. They're all going to be different, right? So you'd have to have a different, different number in each one. And then what happens is you forget that that 
value has been changed or is different and you do a deployment from your sandbox account to your production account or a copy to account and all of a sudden you've got the wrong uh, template ID. So anytime you have uh, values that can be different um, within uh, multiple accounts, it's always a good idea to use a script parameter where you can control that through the parameter. Then when you're setting it up, it's easy to uh, just set it as a script parameter. And if you're making uh, further script changes, you don't have to worry about forgetting that you set that because it's just pulling from whatever was already in the account. Um, there are other cases for it too, like uh, uh, let's say you put in the number one, two, three, four for something, and let's say that's a specific customer ID. And um, six months down the road, uh, the client that you're doing the work for says, uh, we want to change this customer. And now you've got to go make an update in your script, uh, whereas it might be easier to just have gone to the script deployment. Uh, that doesn't require a developer to do really a, a NetSuite ad can do that and say, we want to use this different customer. So, and they can just select that customer and uh, uh, not have to bother with going into a NetSuite script and change a hard code value. Great. Yeah, it's very, very useful. All right. We have our next topic, which are sweetlets. Sweetlets. All right. This is another fun one. Um, basically, NetSuite giving you the opportunity to build your own little application within NetSuite. So um, we have an example set up here. I think it's best to just take a look at this. So you can, th there's a few, th there's actually a few ways to use Sweetlets. I mean, there's, you can, you can build out a UI, build out a UI for customers or for, I'm sorry, for users to, to interact with, right? You can build a form, whatever you need to do for them to actually interact with. There's other times where you just need a Sweetlet that you send a request to, it does some processing for you, and then it returns a response. And there's really no UI involved because you're just calling that sweetlet from, let's say, user event script or a client side script. So there are different ways. In this example here, though, I just did a simple. It's a it's a simple form to create uh, a customer. So it's just going to ask a few. Inf it's going to build this form out, right? So on our request, let's go down to the bottom because this is our entry point. Is on request. On request, what we're going to do is we're going to look to see if the method that was that was called was a git. If it's a git, we know that we're going to load the form, right? So, or we're going to, yeah, so we're going to load the form. We have to create it. So we create the form, customer information. We're just collecting first name, last name, email, and we have a submit button. Once that information is submitted, it's going to go back through on request, but this time it's not going to be a git because we just posted because we submitted. So this really should be, this should say context request method equals post here, it should be an else if. Um, then we know we're posting, we're gonna collect the information that was just submitted through that, that form submission. And then we're gonna, we have a try catch here because we're going to attempt to create this customer record using the information that was just passed. So in case somebody puts in an email, that's not an email, right? NetSuite's not gonna accept that. It's gonna throw in there, we're gonna catch it and we're gonna send that response back to the user. Um, typically, you know, you could also, the nice thing about Sweetlets is you can also deploy out client-side scripts. So you could do front-end validation. So make sure that everything that's being submitted is going to be accepted by NetSuite. That way, the user isn't going to be prompted with these errors that they probably don't understand. So um, that's going to be it. So we create the record, set the values, we save it, and that's going to write back a response that says that it was successfully created, and it's going to provide that internal ID of the customer record. So. This is a really simple use case for Sweetlet. Um, you can get real complex. Greg, I know you've built some pretty complex Sweetlets in your time. So is there anything else you want to kind of touch on? And so just because you can doesn't mean you should. 
<laughs> right? There may be a better way. But um, yeah, sweetlets are great for uh, when you need that quick UI, uh, be able to collect some information from a user uh, in a way that you can completely control uh, where you don't need to store that information immediately there uh, or it's maybe just going to be used for some other event. Like let's say you're trying to get them to schedule a MapReduce, for instance, and uh, let's talk about where we were using a script parameter for a customer. Maybe you want them to be able to select a customer on the fly. So maybe a suite would be a perfect example for where you could uh, pop up a window where they can select a customer and they hit submit and it schedules that MapReduce script using that specific customer passed in as the parameter. So uh, there's uh, a lot of a lot of use cases for a suitelet uh, that uh, where you need a server-side script to run uh, where you wouldn't otherwise have access. Yeah, and I think too at this point it's kind of you, you can tell that a lot of these scripts interact with each other too, right? Like the, having the ability to, to deploy or have a client script running on a suitelet gives you another a layer of, of ability to do validation, do all sorts of different things that you need to do while the user's using the, the form. So, and then also, like you said, you can schedule a MapReduce script with a suitelet. I mean, you could schedule a user event too. So like there's all sorts of ways to use these all together. Right. Um, so yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty much it for Sweetlet. It's like I said, it's simple in form, but in practice, it could be pretty complicated. Okay, great. I don't think we have any questions from this particular script type, so we can move right on to the next and final script, which are restlets. Could you tell us a bit more about restlets? Sure thing, Matt. Let me do. Let me get this script example up. So restlets, these are going to be. These are basically endpoints for them. That's sweet. Um, if you need to integrate with an outside source, someone needs to send you some information. This is how you do it. You create an endpoint in that suite through a restlet. So let me share the code. This is another just simple creation of a contact. I believe. Let me just make sure that is the record we're creating here. It is contact record. Great. So, in a restlet, you have you have your four CRUD uh, methods. Basically, you have your so CRUD is going to be create, read, update, delete. So you've got your create is going to be your post. That's how you would you would create um, a record or whatever you, something new coming in. Um, read is going to be your git. You're trying to obtain information from that suite. Um, update would be through a put. That means you have an existing record you're trying to update with some new data. And then the delete is the delete. Um, that's used pretty sparingly, but I mean, it, it is available there. And in this example, you can just see what how I'm kind of outlining this is. In a post, taking information to create a new contact, setting the values on that contact record, saving it and returning the contact ID. Um, for a put, I'm basically loading the, the contact record that was provided in that request. So if this is a request, it could be an object that's going to contain the data that we need to essentially process the records that we're going to do, right? So that brings up another interesting point too, is that when you're creating an endpoint, you're also dictating how it's going to operate. So you need to tell whoever is sending a request what they need to send over in order to properly make this rest slip work. So, so all of the all the data properties are predefined, all of that, you know, which method you're sending it through. Um, so some documentation doesn't hurt too to help to help those those people out use it. Um, and then your Git is going to be basically you're sending over an ID of a record you want to get some information from. I'm just running a query. You could load the record. This is I don't know, seems a little quicker to me if you just run a quick query, return some information, or if it does not exist, you can send back it does not exist. And then the delete here is going to send, accept an ID to then delete that record. Like I said, I don't know, delete's not common practice. I think we usually try to lean towards an activate because then once it's deleted, it's gone. If you inactivate it, it can always come back. So. Um, 
those are the four entry points in the wrestlet. Greg, I know you've also had a lot of experience with wrestlets in the past. I know a lot of third parties, you know, use wrestlets in their bundles to connect with that suite. So anything else you want to add? Yeah, I would say that uh, wrestlets, uh, probably the most common use case in my experience is when uh, somebody outside of NetSuite needs to interact with NetSuite from a third party app or from uh, some data source and uh, they either don't have a, a developer on staff that can uh, work with either SOAP web services or REST web services, which might, uh, you know, once that's enabled, they could just post uh, content through that to interact with NetSuite. But if they don't have that uh, developer on staff or somebody who understands it, or if they want to put more control on the NetSuite side on what's actually going to happen in their account, that's when they go to a RESTlet. So um, most of the time when I'm using it is uh, basically we're writing custom API for a third party application. Yeah, that is, that's, that is the best use case for it. I mean, like I say, if you need to do anything internally, we, we would lean towards a suite So there's also, you know, authentication that goes into the restlet. So it's, it's secure in that sense. You're going to need some type of, you know, auth authorization or authentication. So and actually, as of, I believe, 2021-2 uh, requires token or um, OAuth2 authentication. You can't use uh, user credentials. Yeah, no more user credentials. Yep. So that's, that is the basic layout of a wrestlet. Um, and that's actually... That is the five script types that we're here to discuss today. So I believe that is that is it for now. Yes, it is. <clears throat> we are nearing the end here. Um, before we go, just to familiarize you all with our structure and what we plan to do, we are going to provide some homework for you as well. And our homework will be actually um, an add-on to this session. In our next session, we're going to circle back to um, when to use what. So each month there's one topic and two sessions. The first session will be much like today. And the next session, we're gonna do a deep dive into the homework and um, go over that on a, a discussion as well. For this month, um, Corey and Greg, would you like to kind of describe the intention behind this question here and what were some of our expectations for the guests? Yeah, so this this situation, this is actually a kind of, uh, it's a common situation. So a NetSuite user wants to automatically generate unique customer IDs, so the entity field. Um, they want to use prefixes based on the customer's division, right? So a customer has a division and they want that entity ID to be prefixed with an abbrevi you know, abbreviation division, whatever it may be. Um, and so they require this functionality for both new and existing customer records. So when the record is created newly, but or uh, new, but it's also for any of these existing customer records, it should update them to to use that formatting. Um, so what is the most appropriate NetSuite script type or combination of types to achieve this desired functionality? So out of the five that we just discussed, what combination of scripts would you use to accomplish this? Um, Greg, anything else you want to add? I think. No, I think that that's it. I mean, not necessarily would have to use a combination, but uh, like, right. what is your yep. solution? Single script or combination? Exactly. And I did just want to add on that you're more than welcome to attend that session without completing the homework, just to absorb some of the feedback that some of the uh, users might run into. And um, this is this is for your benefit. So if you'd like to come and just learn a little bit more about the topic, you're more than welcome. Um, going forward, our next topic uh, meeting will be on Wednesday, July 19th. And our monthly topic for July will focus on user event scripts. We, we did touch on that today, but we're going to spend the entire session going 
through user events in more in greater detail. And we'll have an associated uh, session after that for the, the homework and reviewing user event scripts. And then once we reach August, we're gonna touch on client scripts. And the following month will be sweetlets. And from there, we will jump into data queries and scripting. So there's a lot on the docket, um, a lot to be excited about. Uh, I just wanna thank Corey and Greg for their time today and open it up right now for any questions before we sign off. I don't think we have any questions in the queue guys, but I did just wanna say thank you to everybody today. Um, go check us out on the Boost Forum um, and make sure you sign up uh, as soon as you can.